So it's the first session of the first day of the SOE. It's very nice to have you. It's, of course, very early in the morning, and I'm afraid that quite some people are still registered at the registration desk. Anyway, I, we have to stick to the, to the time, um, and we will take uh, our time to have as much as possible discussion so that we t it is a lively uh, symposium this morning. Our first speaker is uh, George Bacon, and uh, he will speak about the history of the ACCC. So in the beginning, the capsule w was inconsequential to the cataract procedure. We know that couching has been around for the past 4,000 years. Uh, we know that the Babylonians and the Egyptian physicians used couching to dislodge the cataract in the vitreous cavity. And we know that it's been continuously used since then. In the Roman Empire, we have publications that show it was being used. Persian Empire, and even into the 1500s, Barsh showed us how to do couching. So coaching involved using needles in the Roman Empire that seemed to show that this was a common procedure. The technique known as couching involved the use of a very fine needle. Surgeons would expertly insert the needle into the back of the eye to remove the cataract. One slip could have caused permanent blindness. And we know that coaching is even practiced today in some parts of the world. And this is a, a fairly bad video, but it does show the technique being practiced in Africa. Um, as you can see, he takes his sharp stick, he cleans it in the dirt. I'm not sure what, what that helps except to abrade it and make it sharper. Goes in posterior to the limbus. And as opposed to the other video where the couching was done from the sweep downwards, in this case, he's sweeping up and dislocating the, the lens. The lens then falls into the vitreous cavity. And in about 40% of the cases, there isn't any inflammation or any sequelae to the procedure. So 40% uh, success rate in a society where blindness can have huge implications for the patient. So. Uh, the capsule then sort of changed and it became a barrier that had to be pierced. And we know from the um, Shusrila who published 600 BC in his uh, manual that he talked about the technique of cataract surgery. And this is a translation. The patient is seated and restrained while told to look at his, at his own nose steadily. The surgeon will confidently pierce near the natural orifice, so at the limbus, with an instrument the tip of which is tiny like a barley grain. A drop of water will then come from the incision with a noise, so you get a pop. Holding the instrument correctly, he will then scratch the pupil with the tip, having obstructed the nostril on the other side of the eye being pierced, the phlegm in the pupil will, must be removed by snorting. So what you're doing is you're using um, a hollow a reed to enter the uh, lens and then you're using the valve solvent maneuver to express all the liquid. So this was being done at that time and, and we know that that piece also of design, continued on. In that it's, it's a hollow instrument with a introducer. So with this it would be a much a more sophisticated operation of being able to enter the lens itself and then the surgeon would remove the needle from within inside and be able to so suck the lens contents out through the small port. At this stage, the fluid cataract could be sucked out of the eye, thus saving a much greater degree of the patient's sight. It would have been a very effective operation. The Mombele needle is not very different from the electric suction needle used by surgeons to carry out the same operation today. So we have coaching, we have essentially aspiration of the nucleus, and then we get into the 1750s with Jacques Devel talking about actually removing the capsule and uh, expressing the, uh, the nucleus. So there was a corneal incision, an anterior capsulectomy, the nucleus was expressed, and then we had removal of the cortical material. 
And actually, in, in 1985, when I was thinking about ophthalmology and went to Bangladesh to an eye camp, that was essentially the procedure that was being done there. We screened the patients. We had about 500 patients arrive in the morning. We would uh, basically use uh, the flashlight to see how dense their cataracts was, were and make sure there was no other pathology. And then we did the procedure. Their patients were lined up. Uh, a gravy section was performed. There was an anterior capsulectomy. The nucleus was expressed, a couple of sutures were placed, and then the patients who were uh, laid down on their backs for two weeks, and two weeks later we would come back and we would issue them with their glasses. So we've gone from just couching to piercing to actually doing a capsulectomy, and then in the 1900s things changed again. And it's primarily because of Smith. Smith was a, an Irish surgeon who served in the Indian Medical Service, um, he's remembered for being fearless. He smoked while he worked. He once told a colleague, if I have to put down my cheroot, Harvey, it's a bad operation, and if my cheroot goes out, it's a damn bad operation. He would perform more than 2,000 surgeries a year. Remember, if you're doing a capsulectomy, you're leaving a posterior capsule in place, what's the main complication from that, or what's the main worry? Well, the posterior capsule becomes opacified over time, and it requires a second operation and Smith saw this as being a disadvantage. So Smith designed the intracapsular ex extraction technique in order to get rid of that capsule and make sure that once the surgery was done, it was done. So it was a liberal sized wound, strabismus hook on the middle part of the cornea to express the, the, uh, the lens, and it would take about two or three minutes. So in 1905, he performed 2,600 cases, 0.3 rate of iritis, 8% PC rate, 7% vitreous loss, and 0.34% failures. So you've gone from a procedure that you would do with a capsulectomy in the hundreds to a procedure that you would do in the thousands. This then led to the aresophake being developed in order to make that extraction easier. And this is a, uh, a video from 1917 basically showing that procedure being formed. So cocaine anesthesia, the patient's awake, the graphy section. And remember, this is the procedure also that I saw when I was in Bangladesh, except that here we would do an anterior capsulectomy, whereas in this case they're using the erisophake to remove the nucleus. and the operation's finished. Uh, this led to the development of cryoadhesion, so Tadeusz Krawicz uh, developed the technique and Percy and Moyles developed the actual in instrumentation for this. But slowly the piercing of the capsule became more intentional as intraocular lenses were introduced into cataract surgery. So uh, we're all familiar with Her Harold Ridley. He did his first case in November of 1949 waited two months and then implanted the IOL in 1950. And this is uh, him doing his case. This is a cataract at the time of surgery. The white opacity of the lens is visible within the pupil. The only way to treat this is to remove it. Notice now the incision to open the eye. very crude and stressful as compared to today's standards. Dr. Ridley now enters the lens capsule and now is able to remove the cataractus material. The eye is now ready for the implant. A simple plastic disc about the size of a small collar button or about one half the size of a dime. He is ready to insert the lens. Now you see it? Now you don't. He dropped it but regrouped quickly and did the implantation. Surgeries and some of the patients are still 
walking around with that lens in place, so a very effective procedure. The next step was uh, with Charles Kelman introducing fake homulsification. Um, in 1967, he did his first case in the Manhattan Eye, Ear, and Throat Hospital. It was done on a Saturday. It took four hours to do the case. It took 61 minutes of FACO time. Um, this was a blind eye to start with, but the eye was enucleated later on because of uh, infection. So, and this is Charlie explaining his procedure. This is a hard senile cataract being emulsified and withdrawn through a small two millimeter incision. The reduced hospitalization and recuperation time are made possible by a new surgical technique which fragments dissolves and emulsifies the cataract and then aspirates the remnants through its own needle. For Charlie, the important thing was bringing that nucleus up into the anterior chamber because that's where he did his phacal emulsification. And he developed a number of capsulotomies. The first one was this uh, Christmas tree capsulotomy in order to make that easier. Um, Charlie not only invented phacal emulsification, he also invented the uh, subspecialty of uh, corneal surgery because with doing FACO in the anterior chamber you can imagine how many decompensated corneas there were. Um, as a result of that, I mean, people started to say, look, we can't do FACO emulsification in the anterior chamber. We need to be able to do it in the bag because it's safer for the eye. So Kratz proposed using the can opener technique, um, and this is actually one of the things that I saw in residency way back when in the late 1980s that we started to do that in order to allow us to do the phaco emulsification. Um, and then people started saying, well, maybe we should be protecting the endothelium. And this goes to Philip Surdiel and uh, George Bykoff, who introduced the technique of doing this anterior um, incision into the capsule and doing the phaco within the bag and then going back and removing the capsule. Uh, the, the surgeon who popularized this is Albert uh, Galland, who just passed away recently, and that's him doing the technique in which, he, in which he's doing that linear incision. You would then go in and do the FACO and then go back and put the lens in. So once the lens is out, here he is uh, making a small incision, and then he'll complete the capsule rexus and put the lens in the bag. So we also, uh, purposely would use the capsulotomy to hold the intraocular lenses. So Bink Horse designed a two-loop um, lens that would fit into the bag and into and I'd be iris fixated as well. And the problem soon became to realize that with the uh, three-piece lenses that not that they would not always be in the bag and that the can opener wasn't the ideal way. And this gave rise to the continuous tear circular capsulotomy which Furco was using since uh, 1978, but he didn't present it till almost 10 years later. And we're all familiar with these three gentlemen who popularized the technique. So uh, Gimbel gave it the name Continuous, Shimizu, Curvilinear, and Noyan, Capsularexis. The idea of capturing the eyewall with the capsule was further adapted. Uh, we have Marie Jose Tassigno who will show us her technique, but just quickly, it involves making an anterior and a posterior capsulorexis and then capturing the lens within both of those with this specially designed Tassigno bag in the lens. We also have uh, a lens from Oculentis um, that has flanges that go into the bag and then the flanges that go above the anterior uh, capsulorexis in order to maintain the optic in its position. And then we have a design from Sam Maskett in which uh, it's essentially a, a one-piece lens with a ridge in the optic that captures um, the anterior capsulorexis. So uh, lenses that have been specifically designed to fit into the capsulotomy that's performed. We have ways of making the capsulotomy easier so we can use diathermy, um, Erty, Ertley uh, manufactures this device. Uh, we can use Indocyanin Green. Uh, Tripan Blue was developed by Garrett Mellis in 1999, but it was uh, patented by Minus Corneo the following year, and Minus is the one that certainly gained financially from this device. Gentian Violin Methane Blue were tried with devastating outcomes, so please don't use those. 
We can uh, mark in order to allow us to make the perfect capsular axis. So we have corneal markers. We have the tassinio ring that goes onto the anterior capsule, or ex, uh, anterior capsule to allow us to make the rexus. And then we can also use heads-up displays in our devices. Um, Danielle Aaron Rosa proposed using the YAG laser for making capsulotomies. Problem was, was that you would have to do the su surgery almost immediately because the eyes became severely inflamed. We have our own Zoltan Nagy who will be telling us about using the femto laser for making the perfect capsular axis. We have a number of different devices too. We have the capsular laser, which uh, Pavel will show us, and the Zepto, from, um, um, which has just been approved by the FDA. Again, a device that uses nanopulse and um, an ethanol cutting element to make the capsular axis. And we also have this device. It's an ap Aperture RX um, thermal device, which uh, goes into the anterior chamber and then is applied to the anterior capsule and creates the perfect capsular axis. So is the size and centration of the capsulotomy important? Uh, we know that it's important to have a capsular axis. We know that it's important to have the lens in the bag, but is how circular and how perfect it is, is that important? Well, I'd have you think about this. This is what I call the Bridget Bardot uh, effect. Bridget Bardot, as you know, was uh, the most beautiful woman in the 1960s. This is Bridget Bardot now. These are the perfect capsular axis that we see after our surgeries. This is what happens to them after a number of years. So how important is it? And then my colleagues will tell you. So we've gone from the capsule having no role to a crude opening through various iterations of cystotomes and forceps, continuous curvilinear, now we have many devices and we have IOLs that are being developed. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this uh, uh, very nice presentation and uh, all video uh, compilation. So I'm, I'm very grateful for this. And I would like to call uh, my co-chair, uh, Mario Zeta Senior, a simple and reproducible way to make an ACC. Thank you very much. I think it is extremely important to know the history, and thank you for that, George, to bring everything together. I, 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 I uh, witnessed already the presentation that Richard Packard did, but you added some other, other information that is really very useful. And I like the past, and I think we have to, we, we may not forget the past. Lots of things to be learned from the past. Here are my disclosures. I'm consultant for Zeiss, Dea, Alex, and I have a financial uh, disclosure as well for, uh, regarding the intellectual property on the back in the lens and ring caliper that I will show you here in this presentation. And indeed, it is important to know the, the people who were the inventors and on which everything is based. And uh, I was lucky to, me to meet uh, in 1999 uh, Harold Ridley. And what is also important is not only to meet those people, but it's also to read their work. And for example, what he wrote in 1954 after, after having had a, some experience of uh, implanting intraocular lenses, he said, the most important drawback of modern cataract surgery, and everything depends on the period where you, you say those words, is PCO and loss of accommodation. And a little bit later, Charles Kerman, who was also somebody who was a mentor of mine, uh, he was the first one who I, I phoned when I thought about back in the lens. He, his words are just the same. Two drawbacks of modern cataract surgery, PCO and loss of accommodation. And when you see the difference between 1945 and 1998, so apparently the same problems were still unsolved at that moment. Uh, though the surgery was, cataract surgery was also affined, more and more affined and more and more reliable, but these little cells here lining at the internal face of the anterior capsule and also these ones at the equator, these are the causes of our uh, secondary cataract. Are those lens epithelial cells our enemy or our ally? Well, I would say they are our ally, provided that you put them again in their normal physiological condition. And this is the reason why the back in the lens was developed. Before that, we had a lot of, or I had a lot of opportunities to choose monofocal, multifocal, spheric, toric, refractive, diffractive, bifocal, trifocal, accommodative, spherical, 
aspherical, square, round, optic edges, two, three, four haptic, plate haptics, hydrophilic, hydrophobic silicone lenses, fully transparent blue blocking lenses, and all these lenses have been put in the, on, on the market, plus or minus, um, claiming that they will reduce PCO, which was not, of course, because PCO, PCO is in fact a foreign body reaction on the biomaterial and the lens epithelial cells. Now, each of these parameters of these uh, intraocular lenses will influence the final image of the patient, but also the reaction of the capsular, uh, uh, the capsular healing reaction, the contact of the biomaterial with the capsular bag, of course not with the capsular bag as such, because capsular bag is just collagen, but with the lens epithelial cells remaining. So I would say if you prefer the lens in the back implantation technique, take out as much as possible lens epithelial cells, but you might die or have your capsular bag that will become, will become very flaxy and very, very, uh, very uh, rigid. When you prefer the bag in the lens, keep the lens epithelial cells. They will continue their job for which they are programmed, which is to keep the capsular bag transparent and flexible. So pay attention that healing process even if you end your surgery very, very beautifully, you may have decentration that will occur. And this is due to fibrotic reaction, like you see here, and Elschnick performation, as you see here. Now, why to, to have concern about that? We do have a YAC laser. Well, it is interesting, and though uh, Aaron Rosa was, and, and of course uh, we have not uh, to, to forget the, the, the Swiss guy, um, Frank Hauser, who was, uh, who in, in fact was, was, uh, had a broader uh, YAC laser uh, with, with more in indications and with more possibilities than the one of Aaron Rosa. But anyway, this is a very, very big advan adv advance in that time to solve PCO. And still now, it is a very, uh, a very uh, 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 beneficial uh, intervention for the ophthalmologist. Now, on the other hand, don't forget that even if you do a YAC laser capsulotomy, and many people have, have published on that, the quality of the image is not restored as it should be and as it was immediately after surgery. And that is because most of the surgeons, they do forget one thing, and this is in fact something very much new, PCO, accommodation, but alignment. Alignment is so important. And alignment will, in fact, define quite a lot the quality of the image of your patient. And here you see the uh, pre yak laser capsulotomy image, and you see how the patient has a very bad quality of the image, even a hyperopic shift. That means that the lens is pushed back in the, uh, in the, uh, in the capsular bag. After yak laser capsulotomy, it comes a little bit more up, Image quality is much better already, but it's certainly not perfect. And this is, I think, the reason why uh, other techniques have to be in, uh, invented and other techniques have to be used as much as possible. And here you see the, the ring caliper that was designed in order to make a sized anterior capsulorexis. Not only size, but also to try to make it absolutely um, sized according to the Purkinje reflexes. And the Purkinje reflexes are in fact also an invention from the past, but it is something that is so important. If you can align the eye of the patient with the optical axis of the microscope, then the eye is absolutely in the continuation of the axis of the microscope, and you can have a perfect alignment of your intraocular lens. But if you want to do that, you need a lens that is independent of the capsular bag. Otherwise, you have your capsular bag that will define the, 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 the position of the lens within the capsular bag, and this will not help. Don't forget that the capsular bag is not centered based on the, on the vertex of the cornea. So this is something that is absolutely important to know and to, to remind. 
And I will not show you the whole video because it is... Now here, this is most important. Purkinje reflexes, if you align during your surgery the Purkinje reflex one, which corresponds with the anterior face of the lens, and the Purkinje reflex four, which corresponds to the, the, the posterior face of the lens, you have a method how to align your eye. It is, even, it is not always perfect, but this is only possible if you sit as a surgeon at the temporal side. You will also be able to correct for the angle kappa. You will never be able to do that if you sit at a 12 o'clock position because then you cannot align your Purkinje reflexes based on the horizontal movement and the horizontal alignment correcting for the angle kappa as well. So, how do we work? In fact, here you see the patient. We will ask the patient in order to look at the light of the microscope and we center both Purkinje reflexes. Here you see the centration of the Purkinje reflex. In order to do that, you have to ask your company of your microscope where the mirrors are positioned in the microscope. And those mirrors, sometimes they vary. I use a Zeiss microscope. This was the previous one. Now I use the Lumera. But you have to know from the company where those mirrors in the microscope are positioned. And then it is very easy. Once you, you put that ring, you have no influence of the magnification of the cornea, of the, of the, of the, the, the power of the cornea which is one of the reasons why Bucker Dick, when he used the femtosecond laser in babies, they didn't pay into account the curvature of the baby. That is very, 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 very high. The, the, the powers of babies are in the 50s. So that means that your size of the capsular axis will be, uh, will be not accurate enough. But then they, they found it out and then they uh, adapted it in the, in the nomogram within the, in the femtolaser system. You see that you need quite a lot of things to take care when you use a femtosecond laser. Quite expensive device, quite uh, expensive also to correspond and to correct for the corneal uh, uh, curvature. While if you put a simple ring within the anterior chamber, you always have the right size. You don't have to pay attention for that. In order to center it, and George Baco showed you the video, uh, I also de de developed this cage, this cage that I put on the, on the uh, anterior position, on the uh, anterior surface of the cornea. It, it is uh, positioned at the level of the limbus, and then the central part use is, a, is, a, is a mark or is a kind of reference point in order to center as well the uh, ring caliper. And this is very important when you want to use um, toric lenses. Because the toric lenses, you are not going to implant them based on the visual axis of the patient because you want to correct a corneal problem at the lenticular plane. So you need to center the lens on the uh, limbal plane and on the corneal vertex plane. So the back in the lens, well, I think that this has a major advantage that it first it solves the, uh, the, uh, the uh, PCO. It gives you the opportunity to, uh, to align it based on the Purkinje reflexes or based on the limbus, depending on which type of intraocular lens you are going to implant. And now, thanks to the OCTs that are available in a microscope, we can also prove that not only there is a space behind the lens. And now I'm digging in the literature to know everything about Cloquet Canal, about Burger Canal, about Ergerlet Space, about Petit Canal, about Hanover Canal. All those, all those words, all those principles that we learned in the textbooks, but how are they, what is the history behind, that, the, the, behind it? And this is absolutely fascinating. But of course you have to go not in the Google, in the internet. You have to go to the library where all those original books are uh, stored and are available. And here you see very beautifully how both capsules are inserted within the lens groove, uh, being sure that the lens is rightly, correctly positioned. Now, is it enough to position the, the anterior capsule in the anterior groove of the lens? For example, inadvertently, 
I forgot to perform a PCCC, and I implanted the bag in the lens only at the level of the anterior capsular axis. And look what happened. A very beautiful, very regular uh, a PCC, a PCO, due to the fact that you have a beautiful proliferation of the lens epithelial cells remaining in the capsular bag. The big advantage is that you will have not transformation of the lens epithelial cells into myofibroblasts, which will reduce the incidence of contraction of the capsular bag. So I think that what we can give to our patient is a beautiful transparent uh, visual axis of five millimeters up till now, whenever the lens has been implanted, immediately after surgery or even 10 years after surgery, visual axis remains perfectly clear and transparent. Thank you very much for your attention. And then the next speaker, it's my pleasure to, to announce you, uh, Pavel Stodulka, who is, of course, very much involved in the uh, capsule laser and device also to perform uh, an uh, intraocular capsular axis anterior one. Uh, so this morning I'm going to introduce a new laser for opening the capsula. I'm really uh, glad uh, George did such a great introduction of the historical uh, evolvement of uh, this surgical step. Uh, I have been using femtosecond laser for over five years. I've done uh, almost 10,000 femtosecond laser assisted cataract surgeries. It's uh, a great uh, tool, but why don't we all use it for uh, all our surgeries? Well, it's hell expensive and it requires additional time. So that's why uh, we seek for uh, something which would be more cost effective. And this is one of the possible solutions. So I'm co-developing a, a new compact uh, laser called Capsule Laser. Actually, the delivery system of this laser mounts underneath of existing microscope and it fits all the current uh, microscopes. Uh, the machinery uh, is cost effective, does not alter patient flow. In fact, you would uh, do your surgery in about the same uh, manner as you do with manual capsulorexis because that surgical step is uh, pretty fast. So this is a side view of, uh, of this uh, capsule laser underneath of my old size microscope. We do have several microscopes. I also have Lumera. But this uh, ancient microscope is actually my favorite one, and I do most of the surgeries here. The optic is huge, uh, the re reflex is from any angle, and uh, I think this is the best microscope I ever had. Uh, also, the service cost is very low. It runs and runs and runs, so I like it. Uh, uh, even the 3D uh, edge, uh, uh, for 3D 4K cameras, which are on the microscope, are bigger than the laser, so that just tells us about the size of this laser system. So we perform a laser capsulotomy uh, in about one second after everything is aligned and ready. We start inside, go 360 degrees around and go inside again to conclude circular capsulotomy in uh, every case. Uh, the capsulotomy uh, performed by capsule laser showed a really high tear resistance at the lab. Uh, the lab tests were done in California and uh, the laser tissue interaction causes a collagen phase change, which changes the collagen into the amorphous structure and also the edge curves, uh, like you see in the right part of, of the picture, and that improves the tear resistance of this uh, capsulotomy. You can center on visual axis of pupil. We have a blinking uh, aiming beam there, so the patient can uh, look at the aiming beam and the visibility of capsulotomy is uh, significantly improved by blue stained edge, which is uh, blue stained for about uh, 24 hours. And the current uh, capsule laser model comes with uh, diameters of capsulotomy, um, which you can set from 4.5 up to 6.5 millimeters in 0.1 millimeter steps. So as, uh, I have a heavy sore throat today, uh, I will continue with the video with the narration, which is going to overview the current surgical techniques for capsulotomy and capsule laser. A circular opening in the lens capsule is a gate inside the lens for cataract surgery. 
The most common way to open the capsule is a manual capsularexis. Handheld forceps are introduced through the main or side port incision to punch the capsule and create a circular opening in it. The shape is not always circular, and occasionally a capsular excess is either too small or larger than the IOL optic, which can compromise long-term IOL stability. Capsulotomy can be performed by laser with the promises of high precision. Current femtosecond lasers are bulky and expensive, and usually require a dedicated operating room with strict air conditioning control and additional patient manipulation. Femto lasers require a firm connection between the eye and the laser, achieved by a process called docking. Femto lasers cut the capsule with high precision and produce so-called free-floating capsulotomies. But the cost and time are a burden, preventing a wider spread of this laser technology. We have developed a compact and cost-effective device called Capsule Laser, which is mounted under the surgical microscope and performs capsulotomy in one second. The capsulotomy procedure is fast, precise, and reliable. The capsular edge is very firm and elastic, and significantly more stretchable compared to manual capsular excess. Capsule laser is a small device with a delivery system mounted under the surgical microscope. After the tripan blue was washed out, the anterior chamber is filled with OVD. We have used this device in over 50 eyes and obtained a complete circular capsulotomy in all cases. Capsule laser capsulotomy can be used for innovative IOL fixation. The reliable, precise capsulotomy is important for long-term IOL centration. After the surgical contact lens was placed, capsulotomy was performed in one second. The central capsule was removed followed by cataract removal. Blue staining improves the capsular edge visibility. We have used Femtis IOL, which is designed for optic fixation in the laser capsulotomy by means of dedicated microhaptics. The IOL was placed into the cartridge and ejected through a 2 mm micro incision into the eye. The leading haptic was introduced straight in the capsular bag. The micro haptic at 6 o'clock was clipped on the capsule. Then the trailing haptic was introduced in the capsular bag. The capsulotomy edge is very firm due to the collagen phase change caused by the laser. The microhaptic at 12 o'clock was clipped on the capsule. Now the smaller microhaptics at 3 and 9 o'clock are being clipped too. The IOL optic is perfectly fixed into the capsular opening. This way, reliable IOL centration, which prevents the IOL rotation, was achieved. The patient was able to see 2020 unaided with the right eye and 2020 with minus 0.7.5 cylinder with the left eye. He is a professional truck driver who often drives at night. He does not refer any halos or glare at night whatsoever. The OCT image shows side port incisions, the IOL close behind the iris and distant from the posterior capsule. Here is the lens three months post-op. The circular capsulotomy holds the IOL safely in place. The microclips hold on to the capsulotomy edge with very little fibrosis. There are no signs of PCO. Laser capsulotomy serves as a perfect support for IOL centration. 
The ongoing studies are collecting more data with longer follow-up. Capsule laser capsulotomy is a promising new way to perform laser capsulotomy and can make laser capsulotomy much more easily available worldwide. Thank you for your attention. So that was a video about the procedure and of course uh, capsule laser is usually uh, used for convention high walls imp implantation but this was one of the interesting things which I just uh, dare to, uh, to share with you. So regarding the clinical studies, we performed the first uh, feasibility study on 20 eyes with no laser-related complications. Uh, we today concluded CE mark study uh, data gathering of, with uh, 124 eyes. It was a controlled CR monitored study, uh, which again shows laser precision and safety. And uh, the data, I believe, was already submitted uh, this uh, month. Uh, and we run on top of that a series of complicated eyes. We have eyes after PKP. Uh, we cut the capsule through a uh, fake IOL, which is also possible with capsule laser. It works very nicely on white intumescent cataracts too. Uh, regarding the CMARC study, we had very homogeneous enrollment of those 124 eyes regarding the uh, grade grade one, two, and three, and regarding the age groups, and you see all those uh, groups match pretty well, or almost perfectly. We had little more females in the capsulator, capsulator group, but uh, both uh, groups had uh, 62 eyes. So uh, the capsulator diameter mean was uh, five millimeter right on target, manual 4.92 mean, standard deviation 50 microns on capsule laser group and 80 microns on the manual and circularity 99 versus 96 uh, percent. Here are a few pictures just documenting uh, the precision and consistency of those laser capsulotomies uh, which uh, were documented uh, at the study. So this is the uh, overall uh, diameter uh, chart and we have more than 40 a percent of eyes uh, with capsulator exactly on five millimeters and with 0.1 difference we have next uh, 20 and 20 percent so over 80 percent were within 0.1 and you see the yellow uh, columns of the manual uh, capsulorexes are more spread uh, despite uh, the surgeries were performed by two highly skilled and experienced surgeons who each of them performed over 2,000 manual cataract uh, capsulorexis uh, every year. Distance corrected visual acuity not really different in uh, both uh, groups. So in conclusion, uh, it looks like the capsule laser is a very promising new way of uh, laser capsulotomy, which brings cost-effective laser precision. And that's, I believe, the main advantage of this approach. It does not alter patient flow. Uh, sounds appealing to patients. Today we have experience with over 300 eyes and CMARC is being expected uh, by the end of this year. Thank you for your attention. The next speaker is uh, uh, Nagi uh, Zoltan. He is, in fact, the one who started with femtosecond laser in uh, Europe. And uh, yeah, you have to, the merit is yours. Uh, and I think that this is uh, important also to show his results and, uh, and his uh, objective criteria regarding the use of femtolaser in order to make an anterior capsulorexis. Thank you very much. I'd like to tell about something femsecond laser to perform anterior uh, curvilinear capsulorexis. So femsecond lasers have been established in ophthalmology in coronal surgery for flap creation during LASIK procedures, tr uh, coronal transplant procedures, and intrastromal and lenticular refractive procedures. There's a possibility also in sclera uh, to use femsecond laser for presbyopia procedures also and possibly glaucoma treatments. In crystalline lens, uh, the first procedure was in 2008 for cataract surgery, and there's still a trial for presbyopia reversal within the lens. But it's not accepted yet, and it's still in an experimental phase. 
There's also a possibility to use in the vitreous for cutting and possibly imaging and treatment. Femsecond laser looks like this. This small thing comes into contact with the patient eye, this is called patient interface. And this is a monitor uh, for the anterior segment to help surgeons. This is the monitor in an enlarged uh, place, and so uh, this helps the surgeon positioning the corneal incisions, the capsulotomy, you see, uh, the lens fragmentation area, and uh, uh, what kind of pattern we use during femsecond laser prefragmentation, and it identifies uh, the anterior capsule with a micrometer uh, precision, also the lens fragmentation area. If capsulorexis is not performed perfectly, then there might be refractive impact and safety impact. If the size is variable and not centered, then variable IR position and variable effective lens power uh, will be the consequence. And also capsular tears, anterior capsular rupture, posterior capsular opacification may be the consequence, but also there are other consequences uh, if lens fragmentation and coronal incision is not done in a proper way. Uh, what can femsecond laser capsulotomy offer? More accurate in diameter and in circularity, results in better anterior capsule and IOL optics overlap, more predictable postoperative IOL position, but it's also influenced by uh, the healing and by the epithelial cell processes, as you heard it before, better predictability of IOL calculation, more stable postoperative refraction, better optical quality, and decreased PCO rate. Uh, this is uh, the, one of the first uh, videos about femtolaser capsulotomy. It's a real-time video, so it takes a couple of seconds. And then you have this circular and uh, perfectly centered capsulotomy in the desired uh, diameter. So it varies between 4.8 to uh, 5.5 diameter, and in some lenses it can be even larger. Now it's a free-floating capsulotomy, so we can pull it out as a whole immediately, but uh, at the beginning I was a bit more cautious to uh, not to pull it uh, immediately because then it might cause if there are some bridges uh, anterior capsule tear. We did a study in 40 eyes uh, with manual capsulotomy and femsecond laser capsulotomy, and we achieved the precision in diameter within plus minus 0.25 millimeter, no radial tears. Uh, it was easy and complete to remove the capsule and no adverse effect. We compared also with manual capsulorexis and we could achieve the same exactness only in 10% of the manual cases because uh, sometimes the eye moved, the patient anxious a little bit and cannot cooperate and we have to operate now in drop anesthesia and sometimes, especially the younger patient, behave differently in the examination room than in the operating table. The lens position was found to be also more effective. Lila represents the femsecond laser treated eyes and the blue represents the manual treated eyes. Uh, the IOL tilt is also an important issue and we uh, found different, uh, statistically difference in vertical tilt uh, uh, regarding the IOL tilt following manual and uh, femsecond laser assisted capsulorexis. Uh, the small, uh, we found also smaller IOL decentration and statistically the vertical tilt uh, and the uh, uh, horizontal tilt was found to be statistically different in favor of uh, femsecond laser capsulotomy. Uh, less IOL decentration may cause less change in refraction postoperatively, and less IOL tilt may change less change uh, in best corrected uh, visual acuity. Quality of vision is also a very important issue uh, following cataract surgery. We measured the stray ratio and the modulation transfer function, and in all parameters, uh, the femsecond laser treated eyes did statistically significantly better compared to manual capsulorexis. This is the point spread function after traditional manual capsulorexis, it's more coma like, and after femsecond laser treated capsulorexis is more point like, so the quality of image 
air was a bit better and the internal vertical tilt and the internal vertical coma caused this difference. In, other, in any other high order aberrations, we didn't find statistically different uh, result. The better IO position may cause also less PCO, but it's also another issue of wound healing processes. And uh, I think uh, Professor Mario Jose Tassignon showed us that uh, there need uh, a special lenses to uh, completely prevent the PCO rate after uh, either manual or femsecond laser or whatsoever capsular axis is being performed. Uh, we did a study because there are controversial results in the literature. Is femsecond laser capsulotomy stronger than manual CCCs? So we <clears throat> examined uh, 80 eyes, uh, big eyes, uh, and in half of the eyes, femsecond laser capsulotomy was performed, and in the other 40 eyes, the conventional manual CCC. Then we created this ring shape. Uh, 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 part of the anterior capsule, and we measured the force displacement characteristics and the rupture force and the circumference stretching ratio by this way. So we exerted by this way a force against the capsule, and we measured it in millinewton and in millimeter the force displacement distance. So we stretched uh, this capsular <coughs> ring and the third phase, it ruptured, and then we measured, <clears throat> it's a very sophisticated equipment, but we measured the millinewton force that was needed to rupture the, this capsular ring. What we found, that in manual capsular axis, results were more different. So some of the eyes ruptured already at 70 millinewton displacement force, but some only at 300, so it's... Uh, uh, much less predictable, uh, but statistically it's a bit higher than femsecond laser capsulotomy. Results were more even. The reason is uh, the uh, regular uh, uh, shape of the capsular axis and uh, this uh, ruptures with a little bit lower force than manual capsular axis, but it's much more predictable due to the regular shape of the capsular axis. So the rupture force with another plot uh, in this uh, manual CCC group was a bit higher, but uh, the uh, distribution of the results were much more different. In the femsecond laser treated eyes, uh, it was a bit lower, but uh, <clears throat> the standard deviation was much lower compared to the manual CCC group. The circumference stretching ratio was not statistically different between the two groups. We also examined the scanning laser electromicroscopy of the uh, image of the capsular axis. This is the manual one, and this is the femsecond laser capsulotomy. And what we found that when we go down with the energy applied for capsulotomy as much as possible, then uh, the result tends to resemble to the manual capsular axis. Of course, manual capsular axis is much more even the edge of the capsule. Uh, this tooth-like uh, uh, shape of the uh, uh, anterior capsule contour is uh, very characteristic for femsecond laser capsulotomy, and I will be very curious what uh, Pavel Stodulka showed us that what will be the scanning electromicroscopic picture of this uh, capsulotomy done by his equipment. In conclusion, uh, uh, we can say that anterior curvilinear uh, circular capsular axis became more predictable using femsecond laser or other uh, technology as manual uh, method. Uh, we can achieve guaranteed size and centration, so it became a customizable procedure. Uh, the better effective lens position, less increase in higher order aberration, better overlap, and it can be a guaranteed overlap of the anterior capsule, and the PCL optics also uh, may result in, on the long term, better refractive results. The less the energy, the more even the contour, the capsulotomy, and this should be noted by everybody who starts to use uh, the femsecond laser, and we have to change this energy lever compared to f uh, f uh, lens fragmentation energy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.
first of all, I would like to ask whether people on the floor have questions for one or the other speakers. I would welcome their questions first. Not really. Then, uh, do uh, well regarding George Baco. It's straightforward, but it's very beautiful. Now, I was not. I was aware that there was a Canadian who was uh, who performed posterior capsular rexis before Gimbel did, and uh, but he never published the, the, his his work, isn't it? Is that am, am I correct? Ah, oh, yeah. Okay. But you you showed him his. Yeah, but. Ah, there was a, okay, then you have to ask Richard Packard. He knows the name of the Canadian who did the posterior capsular rexis and very late, very recently, uh, Gimbel acknowledged his work. So it's, it's quite nice. So there was, in, there was somebody in between. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, of course. I would like to ask you, uh, Professor Bayard-Pasignan, that uh, do you think that posterior uh, capsular rexis should be uh, performed in all cataract cases in the future? And so w what do you think, what is the future of uh, cataract <laughs> surgery? <laughs> very tricky question. <laughs> now, just like I told you, it is a very interesting area and uh, uh, nobody takes care about that area, which is really there. It is not a virtual space, it is a real space. And uh, now I found out, in fact, that Ergerlet described, who was a, a, an, uh, he, he, he worked together with Gulstrand in, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Sweden, and uh, he described the Ergelet space, which is not the burger space. So behind the, the burger space, there is another space, which is the Ergelet space. So in fact, we do have um, several spaces. Now, I think, that with the high bottle heat that we use, that we cause quite a lot of detachment of the anterior hyaluid, uh, and that we do much more damage to the posterior segment by that than to perform a posterior capsular rexis, even having the risk of damaging the uh, anterior hyaluid, if that happens. Uh, it's always again, again and again the same, just like uh, Kyuntia uh, told us, it is a matter of experience. If you are experienced with that, you do not have uh, complications. But what we also found out now, and based on the changes in the anatomy of the posterior, or of, of posterior face behind the, the, capsule, uh, the, capsule, the, capsule, the posterior capsule, is that we do have pathology and this genesis of the anterior interface as well. And this has been described, and we were in fact, fact the first to describe the congenital, typical congenital cataract based on this genesis of the anterior uh, interface. So I think we just start to know a little bit more about that. We don't have to be afraid of that. I think we have that space because there is a need for that. There is a reason for that. Um, if you, this, and I will speak later on uh, during this, this meeting about the anatomy of, uh, of the anterior segment, because in fact the lens is completely immersed in water completely also behind, and it is logical. Uh, when you think about the mechanics of the accommodation, then you start to understand that it is absolutely logical. So do we need to do that? Well, everything depends, whatever you know, and I was interested, and this is my question for, for you, Pavel, With the, the, by using a color, by using the laser, you probably damage some lens epithelial cells. Have you seen the, the have you studied the possibility of the uh, um, survival of the lens epithelial cells at the margin of the capsule laser? Uh, we haven't studied that yet. Uh, there are some people looking at that, so I think we will get the data. And uh, maybe regarding the burger space, uh, there were also done some uh, posterior capsulotomies with capsule, uh, capsule laser in the lab condition. It looks uh, like it works very well, not really damaging the anterior hyaloid. I didn't have uh, the courage to do that clinically yet, but maybe that's another option. And uh, then if we can achieve uh, both anterior and posterior capsulotomies by this laser, I think that would be a great tool to look again how to uh, incorporate 
your lens or some other lens designs into those capsularomies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, have a, I have a question also to you. May I put on the Yeah, of course. Ah, yeah, the, okay. So it's not working. Uh, I have a question also to you that uh, on the video it was very resembled to uh, diathermy capsulotomy. Uh, I would say it again. Uh, seeing your video, the procedure was very similar to what is being done during diathermy capsulotomy. What is the difference between the two methods? How would you describe? And we saw also that there's a, some kind of a curl uh, of the anterior capsule uh, to the other side. And uh, does it make it more stronger or equal to manual capsule axis? How would you describe this? Well, well, the laser tissue interaction after you stain the capsula is a localized thermal effect. And uh, that uh, thermal effect does not increase the temperature in the anterior chamber that was thoroughly studied. Uh, the difference in between the, uh, this laser approach and the older uh, diathermy is that you don't need to put any instrument into the eye and it's not uh, dependent on the hand movement. So this is more automat automated, it takes one second, it's very circular. So I think it's significantly more reliable compared to that old uh, diathermy technique. Uh, I think what is uh, nice is to perform all those surgical steps by hand. I really admire uh, Tune's videos. I like, you know, the experience, calm surgeon do all those uh, challenging <coughs> steps. But at the same time, not everyone is in that league. And I believe uh, having uh, the options of those newer uh, devices uh, is really good for the market and uh, devices like capsule laser, perhaps Zepto, I believe will fit somehow in between the manual and the femtosecond laser uh, market positions and some people will really be happy to use them, including some teaching facilities. Okay, other questions? If some, some question jumps in, in your mind, please don't hesitate. Uh, then uh, for Nagi Zoltan, do somebody has uh, questions? I think it is, but I was a little bit surprised. Why? How can you explain that the quality of the image was better with the uh, femtosecond laser compared to the manual one? I was a little bit puzzled with that. <laughs> I didn't expect to have any difference. Yes, yeah. It's a small difference. So only in vertical and horizontal coma yeah. uh, results uh, were a little bit better compared to manual capsulorexis. I think we can explain this in the early phase with the better position of the uh, implanted lens, and also that uh, the anterior capsule covered by uh, 0.25 to 0.5 millimeter the uh, optics of, of uh, the posterior chamber implanted lens. So this might be uh, the reason, and I think it would be worse to examine these patients one year after, and I, I guess that there's no, uh, difference, difference, no difference. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think it's uh, not a wonder because the method is the same as fake emulsification, only some steps uh, are being done by the laser, and the uh, capsulorexis regularity and guaranteed diameter and centration I think this is the most important in femtosecond laser technology yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Now, I wonder whether somebody did, and also for Pavel, maybe that's also a question for him, whether you looked at the coverage of the anterior capsulorexis and the lens, whether this was really very symmetric in all cases. And what, what in for your study as well, I would like to know what were the eyes that you selected, I guess, no outliers like minus uh, seven or eight and no plus, uh, plus eight uh, diopters. It was normal. Normal, yes, normal. Uh, you standardize the biometric yes, parameters. Yes, yes, minus uh, four uh, diopter to plus two diopter. So it was normal uh, yeah. range of eyes. Uh, but I think what I, we also examined the myopic eyes, high myopia. And what we found that in high myopia, the people when performing manual capsulotomy tends to be the capsulotomy larger than five yeah. millimeter yeah. because of the anatomical the relations. Is the pupil yeah. dilated well, yeah. then you don't yeah. perceive that is it a 4.8 yeah. or a 5.5 mm -hmm. millimeter. Mm -hmm. So then usually, 
uh, and if it's a pressure from the uh, vitreous, then you have to narrow the pupil at the end of the surgery because sometimes the, the uh, lens, the PCL, bumps uh, in front of the uh, iris. So mm -hmm. I think in high myopic eyes, the guaranteed diameter of uh, capsular axis is, is uh, important to be covered by yeah, yeah, uh, absolutely. By the interior yeah. capsule. No, the risk in in, in uh, high myopic eyes, they don't necessarily have big capsular bags, but uh, they, they more likely may have uh, uh, big capsular bags. The, the problem is, of course, first of all, that the lens doesn't cover completely or stabilize completely the capsular bag. That's first. And then tilt of the lens maybe happens. So in those cases, I always use routinely a capsule tension ring. I don't know if you also do that. Uh, in very high myopic eyes, so when it's over 30 millimeter the axial length, then I do. Uh, in uh, lower range, so when it's uh, less than uh, 30 millimeter the axial length, uh, it depends on the case. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's not, not all the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what, what lens do you implant? Because in I use the back in the lens. I, Okay, <laughs> in, in high myopic eyes. High myopic I, eyes. Yeah. I, if I can uh, prefer, then I, I prefer three piece IOS. Mm -hmm. They are a bit more stable yeah, than, stable, than yeah. one piece. But back in the lens with a capsule tension ring in order to stabilize it, yeah. Um, for you, the, in your study, yes, yes, you can. Uh, in your study, Pavel, you also used normal eyes within the range of the emetropia? Or well, we, we took care to standardize the K readings. I believe it was 40 to 47. Yeah. Uh, but then we had quite a wide range of uh, hyperopic myopic eyes. I don't really uh, remember you know, the distribution, yeah. but we usually get quite a wide range of old all those outliners there, and the laser works pretty reliably there too. And we, as I uh, briefly pointed, we also did quite a lot of challenging cases. So the case like Tune showed the scarred cornea with white cataract, uh, which we, he did great. We also did uh, a few cases with capsule laser, and it looks like even through the hazy cornea, it works really mm -hmm. reliably. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, good. May, may I ask that what uh, wavelengths the capsule laser works? I am not really uh, able to release that. The companies still have some uh, patent issues and they just ask me not to release the technical, more technical Sorry, details I than I did. Sorry for that. We have a question here. Uh, the question for Dr. Buffel. Uh, I, it's, you, you, you talked about your talking. Uh, in white cataract, did you use that uh, technique? Uh, and the other thing, if you have uh, capsular fibrosis or uh, this technique, it will be work or not? Uh, for capsular fibrosis, you mean um, pre-surgical fibrosed mm -hmm. capsula? Yeah. We did a couple of cases and it really cuts through directly. So I think even if you have a plaque on the capsula, very likely as uh, long as you can stain it, if you have a very thick plaque and I haven't run across such uh, a plaque yet, which wouldn't uh, take the dye in and would stay white, then I would uh, be in doubt. But as uh, long as you blue stain uh, that piece of tissue, whatever thick it is, I think the laser is going to cut it reliably. Mm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. yeah, please. Hi, thank you so much for your course. Do you think your uh, bag in the lens or similar arrangements where there's uh, capture of the optic will help prevent late subluxation? Late, oh yeah. Uh, well, this is a very interesting question. You know, what we, do, what we cannot evaluate and see preoperatively is the size of the capsular bag. We have no, well, we, have, we, we can approximate it by using ultrasound, that's it. Uh, what we also cannot see preoperatively is the quality of the zonules and also the anatomy of the zonules. These are two drawbacks, I think, in order to really predict where we are going and, and what, what we can do in a reliable way. But um, based on, on that, I like to use the capsular bag in cases of loose zonules. And that means that uh, the, in cases of loose zonules, in, in congenital of acquired cases, therefore I developed new uh, rings that are called bean-shaped rings 
in order to position them in the sulcus and also in the gro lens groove. And then I have really, I click the lens between both two bean shape, uh, shape rings. Now, of course, the, the back in the lens is too recent and we have not enough long follow-up in order to know whether we can we have uh, zonulolysis, yes or no. I guess that uh, uh, there are different reasons why zonules may break in uh, in post uh, post -surgery, surgery, and that we will we will see. But uh, I don't expect too much to have that, except that uh, that we we I I, ex I expect to have it anyway because it is a disease of the of the zonules. And it's not a disease of the of the cataract as such, or the cataract surgery as such. Now, for for Kyun Cha, I have another question. For the case where the opaque cornea shown, I suppose that this was a patient with congenital measles that he doesn't or he didn't want to have PK or penetrating keratoplasty, and he wanted to get back his vision as he was used to live with. Um. So the, 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 the last case? Yes. Yes. Um, so actually, that, that patient was referred to um, Jeremelis mm -hmm. in Rotterdam. And um, so the, uh, for, for a corneal transplant. But he said, okay, but this cataract has to be removed first. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Otherwise. Why uh, not to do it combined? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, he yeah. was not. Up, that was a very intimidating cataract. It, yeah, it was yeah. really brown. No, but I, it's. But, yeah, but yeah. then, um, so w when the patient was, uh, it was congenital, um, probably measles. When it was taken out, the patient was so happy. She decided not to. Uh, to, to do. Have yeah, the yeah, yeah. Transplant. Absolutely. That's that's the reason why I asked you because I had also patients like that. Very few, but I had. And uh, yeah, you discuss with them, and then in fact, what they want is to find back their vision that they had before, and they are so used with their opacification. Yes. And even if you do PK, they have an amblyopia eh? often, eh? so that you don't you don't in improve their visual well, visual acuity too much. Uh, and and I understand, and then I, I understand why you did it, but uh, I, w I wanted to know whether you considered as well PK combined combination with, uh, no, I'm, with I'm, I'm, I'm just cataract surgeon. So it's <laughs> don't do anything else. Way, American way. <laughs> but you are absolutely right to address all those different cases of complicated anterior capsulorexis situation where you can really, uh, you, you can have uh, problems. And then sometimes, for example, in kids, sometimes I think, oh, if I had a femtosecond laser, because it is sometimes so so uh, difficult to perform. But then I said, okay, be patient, do it step by step, and you, you'll succeed as well. And, then, uh, and then, uh, then finally, I think I'm happy that I didn't spend that money for so much. Uh, the problem is the money, I think. It is a good tool, and, and uh, certainly you have the same results. Why not? But the problem is really the money, and in fact, also the time and so on. So I think that we had a very interesting uh, session, even if I say it myself, but I enjoyed it personally. I would like to thank all the, the speakers and also the audience, even if it is very early in the morning. Thank you.